Hi everyone, it's been a while. In this video, we're finally going to do everything we've learned from using the SPO token from the command line to JavaScript. And now we're finally going to use it on our REST smart contract. So as always, my name is Josh and this channel's mission is to accelerate the world's transition to blockchain technology. So a quick overview of this video is we're going to write a smart contract using the Anchor framework to mint and transfer tokens. And then we're going to write TypeScript tests to validate the program that we've written. And of course, uh, if you want to go over the documentation, this uh, link right here is what we'll be going over through. And as always, this video is sponsored by myself. Check out my playlist. Um, there's a, quite a bit of videos that we have now at this point regarding writing a Anchor smart contract and using the SPL library. So it all builds up this, but in theory, you should probably be able to follow along. And finally, as usual, disclaimer, this is not development advice after, you know, Solana has tanked 80%, you know, don't feel safe giving out any advice that will cause other people to get rug pulled. So, so it's very important to me that I don't get held liable. Therefore, all drugs aside, let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create an anchor project. Free rec, have anchor installed don't have it, check out the past videos. Otherwise, I'm very confident that you can install it yourself. That being said, you know, once you have Anchor, you just need to create a smart contract. So if you're following this video without watching my previous video about Anchor version 0.24.2, you might have some problems running and building. So do check that video out. It's very short, five minutes. But we'll do a quick overview here. I'm just going to pull up my command prompt. As always, I'm going to use my WSL instance so we can actually run our smart contract. Go to my root, go to my video folder, and then we're going to do anchor init. Call it I need to actually go into the video. Okay, now we need token contract. Okay, we created the project, so go token contract. And if we remember, if we look at Anchor version, we see we have the latest version, 24.2. If you don't have this version and you do an Anchor build, you're going to run into issues telling you about dependency. One thing I will say is if you run Anchor tests, you're going to have problems running the tests because they're missing dependencies. And in the previous video, we resolved that by doing believe, yarn install ps mocha. Oh, sorry, yarn add ps mocha. There we go. Okay, so now we have this. We do anchor test. And there you go. I've proven to you that anchor test works and we just ran the, the example test. In retrospect, I probably didn't need to make the past video, but hey, it was only five minutes. All right, anyways, so now that you have this, let's go back to the slide. So with the setup out of the way, let's start talking about part one of what we want to do, writing the smart contract. So this will be broken down in two parts. The first part is we're going to write a smart contract that will mint a token to a specific account. The second smart contract is we're going to create a transfer transaction. Specifically, we're going to transfer a token from one account to another. So to be able to help write our code, we're going to rely on the Anchor SPO token library. It's essentially just a wrapper around the original Solana SPO token library, which is, I'll include the link right over here. And so before we jump into the code, I just want to give a quick recap of how Solana works to help wrap our minds around this. So Solana uses the concept of accounts to keep data on the Solana network, and that account is tied to your public key, specifically your wallet. So everything is an account, including our tokens and NFT that we've created in our previous videos. They're all an account that is owned by our wallet. To be able to hold a token and NFT, we need to create an associated token account, an ATA, that our wallet owns, which allows us to actually receive and hold the token or NFT. Um, it's nothing too fancy. It's essentially, it's just a account. So with the account information out of the way, let's look at some of the code that we'll be looking at. So if we look at the Anchor SPL library, we have this mint to function. I'm just gonna pull it up, make it bigger for all of us to see. And this function essentially, underneath uses the Solana SPL token library to actually, for Anchor, all we need really is two things. We need a CPI context and the amount that we want to mint. So the CPI context really is two things. It is the program that we're using, which is this gigantic mess. Don't worry, we'll see what it is. 
and then we need to give it a min2 uh, struct. So if we look at the min2 struct, which if we go back to here, we see that it's mentioned right here. If we look at the min2 struct, it takes in three parameters. The mint, which is the account that holds the NFT or token information that we have. For example, Solana as a token might be the mint, and then it is owned by, let's say, myself. And so as the owner, I can, uh, I can arbitrarily mint Solana to other people. <laughs> if only that was the truth. Now, so that's mint. That's the first parameter. The second parameter in our mint2 struct is two. Uh, this is essentially just the account that we want to, uh, ATA specifically, that we want to mint our token into. And then finally, we need the authority, which is the, you know, the wallet or whatever, the, the wallet key, for example, that actually owns the mint. So we can have the authority to mint our token. Otherwise, without the authority, anyone can mint tokens arbitrarily, and that'd be bad. So that's what the mint2 struct is, and this is what our mint2 function takes in. And then once we call this function, it will execute all the code, and it will essentially mint more tokens that we have to the account that we specify. So before we actually start talking about the code, let's talk about what we might actually expect as a requirement for our code. This is right here, our mint transaction requirement. So there are essentially five things that we need for our code. The first thing is we need the token program. I'll show you how to get it. It's, it's just a, a static thing for our CPI context that we're going to use. And then we'll need the four parameters that we're going to pass in the amount that we're going to mint. I'm just going to hard code this, but we can easily pass it in as a parameter or as a, a account information if we wanted to. The third thing is uh, we need the token account that represents, you know, the token that we want to use to mint. We want the account that we want to mint the tokens to. And then finally, we want the authority that was used to create our token so that we can actually mint the token to. So these five things. So with that being said, let's get started with the code. As always, we need to pull up Visual Studio Code. And as always, you know, I have my WSL remote uh, Chrome extensions. You can see them right here. What, I, what you really need is remote, SS, uh, remote WSL. So you click on the bottom left corner right here, open a remote window, new WSL instance, this. And then you just click open folder. And we'll just go to where our video is located, where our project that we created was located, which is video token contract. Okay, and this will open up our project. And as always, our code is located inside programs and source. Bigger for us. And then we open librs. And this is our smart contract code. As always, a quick overview. This token contract is our main function that we're writing or our program and each of the functions that's inside our class is a transaction that we can use to handle and then for each of these functions we usually associate each of the transaction with an account so we have an initialize account and this and this just specifies the data that we're passing in from the front end to our smart contract and so as always we're just i'm just going to copy and paste to save time not going to go into some of the details of our variables. You can go check out some of the past videos or the Solana doc of anchor doc to kind of talk, learn what they are, but we've talked about this in the past. The first thing is we're going to remove initialize with this mint with a new mint token function, but this is just the data we're going to pass in. So there are four things that we're passing in or so inside our mint token struct that we create it, we're going to pass in four things. Uh, apologies for being out of order, but First thing, as we mentioned, was the token program. This is essentially is just the program for our CPI context so that we can mint our token that we specified. The program struct just has these two types. I wouldn't worry too much about it. It's just mostly a copy and paste. Now, the next part is we have our mint, and this is a unchecked account. It actually, I don't think it has to be an unchecked account. I think it actually can just be another. It can also be an account info. I don't think the type as long as the account really matters too much. It's a unchecked account, and this mint represents the token that we want to create more copies of to another person's account. So you might notice some of these syntax. We have this hashtag account mute. Uh, this means that we'll be mutating the account. I actually, in this instance, don't think 
that this is necessary, but I already have it in my cheat sheet, so I'll just keep it there. Because we're not technically touching the min account. But it's because I marked this as a mute uh, mutation, we also need to include this comment right here. Otherwise the anchor otherwise the anchor compiler will complain. And basically all it's saying is just give it a, just leave a comment saying why the code is valid and why we're modifying it. So next up is the token account. The token count, which I apologize, I should have probably had better comments regarding this, is who we want to mint our tokens to. This one is another unchecked account. It probably could also be account info, honestly. We're going to, we're going to roll with this. Um, and this is a account that we want to mutate because we're going to add tokens to it. And very important to mention, this is a ATA. It, it's unfortunate because we actually kind of can't distinguish between what type of accounts that we're receiving in Salt and Anchor. So but it is what it is. And then finally, Payer, who unfortunately I named it poorly, I, uh, comments, but this is our authority. This is the user who can authorize us to mint tokens to, to our uh, token account. Hopefully the variable names aren't too confusing in our struct, but that is what we're working with. And the next up is we need to actually write our function. So I'm going to remove our initialize function. And I'm just going to paste in the mint to mint token function that I've already rewritten. And we'll just kind of go over it. So our mint token function, we receive our context and this context would include our mint token, which as you can see is this variable that we've already created in our struct. And this function as all transaction does returns a result. And the result is either it succeeded or it failed. This code is actually pretty straightforward, uh, very short. If you want, essentially, you just want to use anchor to mint tokens. This is what we need to do. The first we need to create our mint to uh, struct. Remember when we were looking at the documentation, we'll pull that back up. Right, into our mint to struct, we just have these three variables, mint to and authority. And that is what we see right here. So our mint is our mint account info that we created down here. And we can access that by calling our contacts, get the accounts that is associated in our contacts, which is our mint token. And then we just get the, var the variables that we specified, which is mint. We call it to account info to get the specific account info type that we need. And don't worry about knowing it. You can probably look at examples and basically copy and follow along. Or, you know, actually dive into documentation. That's also great too. And we do a very similar thing with who we want to mint tokens to. We mint tokens to the token account that we specified. And the authority um, is the payer. Uh, I apologize to the name again. I'll add better comments for the GitHub repo. But in this instance, the payer is the person who is the wallet that owns the authority to the, the mint account that we created. So this creates our mint to struct. The next thing we need to do is we need to get the CPI program for our CPI context for our mint to function, which is call is right here. Our mint to function takes in a CPI context and the amount. And of course the CPI context takes in two things. The two things it takes is the CPI program, which we passed in. It, essentially we just want to pass in the token program to use. And we do that by taking the token program that we specified, which is right here. We can go oh, right here, which I'll show you us how to get this later in the front end. And we just call the account info of it. And then we just create a new CPI context, which takes in the program that we passed in and the min to struct that we created. And once we have that, we can finally call our min to function. And you might notice that there's this token colon colon min to. Uh, the token is a function that we didn't specify. Actually, it's an import. I'll include it up here. So we're from our anchor SPL library, we import their token function, which actually if we, or token module, which if we actually go back and look that anchor SPL, we see that inside the library, there are three modules, the associated token, mint and token. If we look inside the token module, you'll see all the structs of the operations we can perform with our SPL library. 
and all the functions that will actually execute the data that we take in from our structs. So I highly recommend you also look into it yourselves and to kind of learn about the, all the operations you can do and what you need to uh, pass in to execute these functions. Anyways, back to our code. So yeah, so that's what our um, token module is. What we're just calling the token module and we're calling the mint to function. And of course, just to be thorough, we also import the structs type that we're using. Um, some of them I'm not using quite yet, but we will. So anyway, so we call it the mint to function and we pass in our data and we want to mint 10 tokens. In a typical Rust language, um, we call the question mark essentially to just get the results of our data, which I think mint to probably just returns a result object or enum specifically. And if we call question mark, it basically means get the data and I promise that it exists. And if it doesn't, it'll crash, which is okay because that's what our program expects to have a result of either success or failure. And if it doesn't crash, that means everything's great. We will return okay. As we know, if you've seen the Rust video, if we have code file semicolon, that's a return statement. And that, my dear viewer, is how we mint tokens using Anchor and the Anchor SPL library. All right then, continuing on from our mint to transaction, we're going to implement the transfer transaction. For us, the part afterwards, we're going to talk about testing and how we actually test. So as always, here's the documentation. So we have transfer, very similar actually to mint2. We have our CPI context, but instead of taking a mint2 struct, it takes a transfer. And then we also take in as our second parameter, the amount that we want to transfer. So let's see what's inside the transfer struct. So in our transfer struct, we have three things. From, this is the very important, the ATA for the account that we want to take the whatever token we have from. So to be, to, to, to be clear, if I made a token called GooberGab, I need to create a ATA for my wallet that holds the GooberGag. And likewise, we need to provide a two account, which is another ATA that we want to move the, the a certain amount of tokens from. So. In our previous videos, the two account, if it didn't exist, we would manually create a ATA for the specific wallet. But in the case of our example, we're just going to kind of have everything pre-created. So just to keep things kind of simple. And then finally, we need to give the authority of our from wallet so that it can send the data from the ATA. Otherwise, if we don't have this, literally anybody can move tokens from one account that's owned by anybody else to anyone, to themselves which is a security vulnerability. That's what we need. So as well as we go back here, so our requirements, we need five things. We need the token program for our CPI context. Same thing like last time. We need to provide the amount that we want to transfer, but like the mint code, we're just going to hard code this value. And then we're going to take in the three parameters that we need for the transfer struct. We need the senders ATA, the receiver's ATA, and then finally, the sender's authority, AKA who the, the wallet that owns the, the sender's ATA. So now that we have this, let's actually go back to the code. All right. So just like before, we're going to define our transfer token account that we'll use as the parameter type to represent the accounts that we're passing in. Here's the copy and paste. So our transfer token struct that we create, so first of all, we need to extend or derive in Rust, copy paste, and everything will be fine. And so like we before, of the five things that we need, we need to pass in our token program. We want to pass in the from account, uh, the, the from ATA specifically. And this, of course, has to be, we have to mark it as a mutatable account because we're taking tokens from this ATA and giving it to someone else. And of course, um, we need to leave some comment. I kind of just copy and pasted the comment, but... You just need to leave something. And likewise, uh, from a from, we need to also pass in the to ATA that we want to transfer the token to. And finally, we need the signer. I actually don't think we need this uh, account mutate, but the signer is the owner of the from ATA. And it's just a special type called signer. Actually, I think you can actually use any account. It doesn't really matter. But um, in this instance, we're using the proper type, which is signer. So now that we have that, let's go copy and paste the transfer token function that we're going to implement. A couple of things to note, 
we pass in the transfer token as our contacts. This is kind of similar to what we're doing with our mint token. And just like before, we need to create our uh, transfer struct or transfer instruction, I call it this time. And it takes in the three things that we talked about our from ATA, our to ATA, and then the authority, which is the signer. We get our CPI program because that's needed for our CPI contacts. So we define that. And of course, we need the CPI contacts so we can call the transfer function. For our code example, we're just transferring five tokens. And that's roughly it. It's actually pretty straightforward once you have the understanding of the code. And the hard part, really, was understanding what you were even passing in the first place. These were, let me tell you, these were not easy to figure out in the beginning. It took me a while to realize that these parameters have to be the ATA and not the wallet or anything else. But that's it for implementing our smart contract. If we hit save and I hit uh, the control wiggly line button and I type anchor build, this should build our code and everything should be great. All right, actually, apologies. There was actually one thing I forgot. Um, we've imported these modules, but, uh, but Rust doesn't know anything about them. So what we actually have to do is we need to actually define our module that we want to import. So we do that by going to our programs folder and go to our cargo.tomo. And if we scroll down, very bottom, you see that we have our dependencies over here. And so all we need to do is import our anchor SPL library, which is anchor SPL. And we just give it the version, which in this case I know is uh, 0 0.24.2, which is the same version as anchor lang. Now, go save, anchor build, and it should work this time. All right, so there you go. Now our code builds properly. So that's it for our implementation of our smart contract. Now we just actually need to test it and make sure it works. All right, and here's part two. We are writing the tests for our program. We'll be using the Anchor workspace to be able to do this. Um, the test will be written in TypeScript and we're going to be using fake wallets, a fake token, and we're going to create an ATA for our token, uh, an ATA for the specific token that we created for each of our fake wallets. Um, I didn't really leave much detail here. We're just going to follow the code, but I think we can follow along and learn quite a bit. Okay, so here's our code again. So we're going to open up the Explorer again. We're going to the test folder that has been conveniently created. And we're going to our token contract. That's yes. And this is essentially our test that has been given to us. Uh, one thing I will note is that it is so much easier and I highly recommend writing tests for your code. And that this isn't just me being a, you know, a snobbish software developer. But it actually is much easier to write tests to talk to your smart contract versus uploading your code to the you know your 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 local host and then writing some front end code to test your code. Although there are some advantages like being able to debug better, I, I will give it that. But in terms of ease of setup, this is actually way easier, faster to iterate. So let's take a quick look at what we ha already have in this code. So this is a Mocha test for those who are not familiar with it. Um, describe just ex describes the suite of tests that we might be running, and each of the it is an actual unit test that we're going to run. So this is just the default boilerplate test that we've received. Um, it's the function, the test name is called is initialized, and inside this async function is the actual test itself. So you see in this code we call anchor that set provider, and we provide the anchor provider environment. All this really does is it just sets a sets up your environment essentially. You know who who your local host that you're talking to. It creates a wallet for you and things like that. And you can access all of it by calling. And then to be able to access the smart contract code that we have easier, we uh, the, the, we have a boilerplate call, that calls anchor that workspace dot token contract. Token contract here is is just a type that represents the smart contract that we've written. In my previous video, I touched a bit about it, but we no longer use this old uh, program.rpc method that's deprecated. Now we use something called methods, and then we just specify the specific transaction that we want to test. And if we want to include any uh, metadata, like our accounts, we can do something like accounts, 
or signers. So we get a error right now because initialize doesn't exist anymore because as you might recall, I removed it from mint token. So if I just do mint token, you can see that exists. The first thing that we're going to do is I'm going to cheat as always and just copy paste. I'm not going to waste our time typing this up. We can probably just copy from GitHub. So I'm going to go through our code one by one. So first of all, we have our public wallet key. And this represents the key that we created over here when we, from our anchor provider for our anchor environment. And this key specifically will be the owner of a token that we're going to soon create. And we'll be also minting some of the token that we just created to the specific wallet or more specifically the ATA owned by this wallet. And to create an ATA, as we all know, we need to create an account and to be able to store an account on the Solana network, we need to pay rent. And that is what this function does. And it just a copy and paste, but program just has a, a function that we can call it that defines the minimum value we need to pay rent for. And to figure out the land ports that we need to pay, we need to, pay, uh, we need to specify a struct uh, data so we can calculate that. And this will just be something that we will import from the SPL library, which we'll probably also need to install later. Yeah, we'll install this later, but uh, it's here. I'll just copy and paste some things, but uh, mint size is one of them. So now we know the value of what it takes to create a mint. Remember, we can always create an account, but until we send that account to a smart contract, it would actually never be stored on the network and it will never be live. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create an associated token account for our from wallet, as you can see right here. And this function will take in two things. Should we look at the code? Okay, it doesn't let us go in. But uh, you know what? Just so we can do some exploration, let's install these libraries first. Um, yeah, okay, great. So we open up our Explorer again. We go to our package.json. And inside our dev dependencies right here, dev dependencies essentially is our dependencies for our tests. We'll just import the, oh, we'll include the Solana BL token library. And we'll just take the latest version. And then we'll just do quickly do a uh, npm install so that we have this library dependency. That'd be great. So now we have that. Let's go back to our test again. Okay, so, so you see the red arrow went away. So yeah, if we take a, quickly take a look at the get associate token address, that's F12. You can read some of the code with what it does. We get the address of the associate token account for a given mint and owner. So this uh, gets us an address of an account, but the address doesn't, ne doesn't necessarily exist. So that's our job to create it. So we call this function, which will then get the address for the ATA, which you know, doesn't exist yet. And the ATA that we're generating is for a, this min key. We will go into what this is later. It is the token that we are creating. And we're providing the public key to our wallet, or this really is just this key. We probably could have called it a key. So we're getting the ATA for the mint that's associated with our wallet. So let's, let's quickly uh, make these error go away. The first is we need to create an associated token account variable. And the reason why I did it this way, uh, made it a, a, a global field is because, well, I'm lazy. I'm just going to recreate it. So bad practice, I know. But essentially what's happening here is I'm going to create this account. I'm going to store the address as a global variable, and we're going to just reuse it in our other tests. The min key, and I apologize, I actually made a mistake in my wording. It's been a while since I looked at my notes. The uh, min key actually is another key pair that actually represents our the mint token that we're going to create. So I misspoke when I said that mint is actually an account. Um, it's actually a... The, the, the token that we're you know we want to create will be actually be hosted on a wallet. If that's confusing, don't worry about it. Just follow the code and copy and paste, and everything will be great. So now that we've defined a main key, and uh, if we want to create a new wallet, it's pretty straightforward. We just call the anchor framework uh, Web three key pair, which is the wallet type, and we just call generate, and it just randomly creates a new key pair for us to use. Really. 
That being said, uh, things uh, might be a little bit different. It might not exist on the network yet, but that's okay. We're still, we can still uh, use this code to get the ATA. So now that we have some of the addresses that we need, we actually need to create all these accounts and actually store them on the network. And so we need to create a transaction because remember in all the past videos, we first created the account, created the token, then we transferred, uh, then we minted some tokens and then we transferred some tokens. So in this instance, we're going to skip the creation phase. Uh, we're going to write a TypeScript code to actually do that part. And then we'll call our smart contract code to do the minting and the transferring. So to create a transaction, we just basically copy this code. And then we're adding an array of transactions that we want to execute one after another. The first thing we need to do is we're going to create an account. And if you read it, the code, it says generates a transaction instruction that creates a new account. And the goal of this is to essentially uh, put the main key that we created. Remember, which the main key represents our token, the, the new token that we want to create. And we just want to put it on the network. And so the types that you take in, if we can go in, it takes a create account param. And these are the five things that we provided. The from pub key, which essentially is the account that is paying for all this operation. The new account pub key, which is the new key that we are adding the account to. And then of course, how much rent we're paying, which is landboard, the space that we're giving the new account, which is a constant that we provided. And then of course, who is the owner of this new account? Okay. So that's what this create account does. It essentially just creates a account on the network, on the Solana network for the wallet that will be hosting the token that we're generating. The next step is me to all the function create initialize mint instruction. This is just something we imported from the Solana SPL token library. And what this does is it, in my guess, actually initializes, i.e. Um, creates the token that we want to use. Ember, a token essentially is just a, a string of numbers and letters that is used to represent something. And this creates that token for our public key, i.e. our wallet. So now that we create an account that will represent our token or NFT, we, which is done here, we, and, and then we initialize the, or minted, we initialize the mint, i.e. the token of the account that we've just created. And then finally, we need to actually place the ATA that we created for our anchor wallet, not the, not the NFT wallet that we just created, or not the token wallet that we actually created. And it gets confusing. Uh, but we need to put the ATA on the Solana network so we can actually use it. So we create an account that can hold the tokens. And so we do that by calling this create associate token account instruction. You know, lots of fun things learned by reading the documentation. So anyways, we have this, we create, we have our transaction and then we just call the send and confirm the transaction, which executes the code execution, all oh, the instructions that we created. And we make sure to pass in the main key, which is the signer, because it's, you know, we're doing everything on our main key pair. And the end result of that is we get a result object. And just for some fun that we were, I was looking at other code example is we can actually get the data for our main key and just see what is in there. We can look at that in our test results later. Uh, so we're just looking at the account info of our our key pair that holds our token that we are minting. And of course, for thoroughness, I did some console log for, for some of the data that we're using. Nothing too important, honestly. Now that we finally done all the setup work, yes, unfortunately, all of this was just setup work for the actual code that we're going to be writing. We can finally start actually testing our smart contract. So the, this whole test was to test our mint token. Can we mint? tokens into another account. And so we just call program methods in the smart contract instruction that we implemented. And then the accounts that we need to pass into it. Uh, remember if we go scroll down here, these are the accounts that we specified. So we need to pass these data in. And the four that we specified was we needed the mint the token program, token account, and the payer. So the mint is the account that actually holds the, you know, the token slash NFT that we want to mint. So that's what this public key represents. Uh, one thing I want to say is public key actually is a, it's just a type. Yeah. 
it's just a public key type, which essentially is just a function that holds like strings. But you'll notice that if you actually look inside of the code, that is not what these types that we're getting back are. Unchecked account is you know not a public key. And just to clarify what's happening here is that when we send the public key over to our Solana smart contract, that key gets translated into an account. So that's why we're just passing the account. And that's why we can also interchange the account types that we specify for our structs because there's some, some code in the back end is specifically adding the account type that we, we specified. So anyways, so that's our mint and this is how we created it. Next, we need to pass in our token program. And that's pretty straightforward actually, surprisingly. It's just a constant public key that we import from our SPL token library, which you can see right here. So we just pass that in and everything's great. And then of course we need to specify the token account that we want to mint some of the tokens to. And so we are going to specify the ATA that we created over here for the public wallet created for our anchor test. I promise I better comments in the GitHub code and, and probably also update some of the variable names. So yeah, that's what this is. And then finally we have the payer which really is actually the signer, the authority of the, of the token that we created. I apologize, I should have specified this more closely. So going back, why is key the authority of our main key, which is a neural wallet that we created? Well, if we actually go back into our create initialize mint instruction and we look inside the code, um, we're passing four things, the, the mint public key, zero, key, and key. Let's see what they are. So the first one is the mint. So this is the token mint account that we just created. That's the pair key. And then next we have decimals, which is, you know, how many zeros do we need to have one whole token? And then finally we have the mint authority, which is essentially who owns the token mint account that we're creating. And so if we look inside our code right here, when we're creating our mint token accounts over here, we're saying that our anchor wallet that we have, like my wallet in this example, it is the authority of this token. So that is why it is the signer for our code. Um, so now that we specify the accounts, we just call RPC to initialize our code. Um, this returns a transaction, which we can just print out, nothing too important. And then just to check results, because you know, any good unit test, you know, we actually should verify that, you know, the expected result happened. We want to see how many token has been created in our account. And so if we look inside our code, uh, we call our program provider connection, we call the get parsed account info again, and then we pass it in the ATA that we just minted tokens to. And this, the reason why I know this is because I did a lot of debugging <laughs> with console.logs, but with the account that we got back, if you call the value data parsed, and it's bad because you know that this is an error, but we'd still use it and info and token amount, and we get the amount, we can actually get the amount of tokens that we have minted for our ATA. And so in our code, we hard coded the 10 to be minted to this account. So we're just checking to see if the minted value that we have now from calling our smart contract is equal to 10. And of course we use a cert to verify this. I'll import this code up here from our chai library, which has already npm installed. And, and so we're just asserting that the value we have is equal to 10. And if it is, everything works and everything's great. So now to prove that everything is correct and it works, let's run anchor test. All right, done. And as you can see, the test has passed. So let's pull this up and quickly look at some of the data that we had. So this is the parsed account info that we created. So as you see, this is how I debugged. There's the value data parsed and then I, I console log to see what this object was. Yeah, here's the parsed account of our mint key for our token. And you know, this is what it represents. Quite frankly, I don't really know too much about it either. So I won't go into the details. And the rest of the stuff we don't really care too much about. It's just, you know, account numbers and keys are hash values that really mean nothing to us. So that's how we test our mint token. So hopefully this has taught us a bit more about some of the underlying of how, what accounts are and how they work and then how to write more tests. Because let me tell you, this took forever to do. Great.
So that's min2. Now let's write some code to test our transfer. So as always, just gonna copy and paste. So here's our transfer token unit test. We're going to get our wallet public key. Remember this wallet, this public key is the owner, the signer of our token that we created. It also holds some tokens. So we're planning to send tokens from this wallet to another wallet. And uh, in, in this example, we're going to create our wallet by you know, using Anchor to generate a new key pair. So this is the two wallet. And of course, remember, we can't just transfer tokens to a wallet directly. We can only transfer tokens using the ATA, the associated token account. And so like always, just like what we did earlier, we get the ATA of our two wallet that we just generated. We use the, the main key of our token and we want to get ATA of our specific token that is associated with the two wallets. And that'll give the address, but you know, just like before, that doesn't necessarily mean the address actually exists. So we need to pay Lamport to put it on the Solana network. Similar, this can be done by the owner of the wallet, or it could be done by the person who is sending the token. And you, this might also be why you see some like NFTs or scam tokens that are added in your Solana wallet. And that's because someone else paid Lamport to put an ATA on your account so that they can send you those scam coins. But I digress. So the first thing we need to do, and so just like before, much simpler, uh, because we already created a lot of the variable, uh, we just need to create the ATA for our true wallet. We, we did this uh, earlier in our example up here, so I won't dive too much in, into the details. So we have our transaction, and then we just execute our transaction and get our resolve, which transaction ID, which we don't care about. And so that, and so that creates our ATA for our two wallets. So now that we have everything set up, we're going to test our transfer token code. We do that by just calling, you know, program methods transfer token. That's our instruction that we implemented and inside the accounts, which as we recall, again, we define right here, we need to take in these, uh, four parameters, uh, which I include right here. We need to pass in the token program, which is just a constant variable that anyone can use from, which is our ATA that we are moving our tokens from. Uh, we already saved this from our first test. Yes, I know it's bad coding practice, but you know, we saved it right here in our mint a token test. But we're calling that. We're sending that to our two, which is our, you know, the two ATA that we just created and put on the net Solana network. And then finally, we're passing in my wallet, which is the owner of the associated token account. Otherwise, if Solana was implemented without this functionality, with a signer, anyone can send anybody else's token to themselves. So it's a very dangerous game. Anyways, so the signer is the wallet, AKA the owner of the associated token account. We call RPC again to execute our smart contract instruction. And we can just do the same thing to assert and test our code work properly. So same thing as before. Um, there are two ways we could have tested this. I unfortunately did one, but I just grabbed the ATA that's associated with the default wallet that we created, not the new one that we just created, but the existing one. And we just check how many tokens now exist on this wallet. And it should be five because if we go back into our smart contract, we see that we hard coded just sending five tokens to the two wallet. Our main wallet, which we minted 10 tokens to, now only has five because we transferred five away. And if I want to be complete, which unfortunately in this case I did, I could have this exact same code run with the, instead of the associated token account, we could use the two ATA and check to see if the amount that we received was five. But anyways, so that's that. So save that, open up the terminal again, and I run anchor test. And there you go, two passing. If we scroll up, we can see that, uh, well, nothing too important to see, but both of our tests are passing. And that is it for writing test code to test our mint2 and transfer token. Hopefully you picked up some understanding of ATAs because that was the biggest thing that I misunderstood for the longest of time. So let's go to the conclusion. So you know, here's the conclusion and some warning. Conclusion for writing our test, 
do write tests for your code. It makes it so much easier to iterate on your smart contract. Um, the only one tidbit I will add is that you can't, you unfortunately can't get any log data in the smart contract code that you write. So you actually don't know what is going wrong when you're using unit tests. So the only way you can actually test that is actually deploying it on your local host and writing, writing some front end code to execute the smart contract. Wrap everything up again. In this video, we learned to use Anchor's version of the SPL token library to mint and transfer tokens. And then we wrote unit tests to make sure that our code works as expected. Just from following the code and probably reading the documentation of the functions that we're calling, you'll probably actually learn quite a bit about Solana. So this goes to my warning part now. So this code is unsafe, at least, you know, it hasn't been validated or anything. And it's really for learning purposes only. We don't do any validation or, you know, check to see if the users who they say they are or any other conditions. Um, it's just generally not safe. <laughs> And a great example actually is our transfer function that we implemented. Normally we would never pass in the, the from account and the two account together. We actually probably use a PDA, you know, topic in future videos, hopefully that would actually act as an intermediary between both of them so that neither would be able to abuse this. These were a long time video in the running. I promise I'll edit the code to make it more clean and upload it on GitHub, but we have basically covered everything I wanted to talk about for the token libraries. So that being said, what's next? Well, I'm glad you asked. We are actually now finally at the point where we can actually write, start writing some applications. So that is what I'll be doing next. And, you know, as usual, expect these videos to take forever to come out. So I really appreciate you sticking around, but you know, until the next video, thanks for watching. Please like, and subscribe, help the channel grow, and I'll see you all in the next video.